we'll talk about, we'll do a SWOT analysis and we'll do a SWOT analysis by department, you know? So we'll go through and say, you know, investor relations, what are our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? Construction team, property ops team, uh, executive leadership team, or, or for Spartan, you know, what, what is our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? And we'll kind of affinitize a lot of the things that sort of boil up to the surface as our kind of our key things that we want to focus on. And welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Ryan Gibson is the co-founder, president, and chief investment officer of Spartan Investment Group. He has organized over $200 million of private equity for Spartan's projects across the country. And in case you aren't aware, you can go back to Ryan. He came actually on the show a long, long time ago. You were actually guest number 41 here on the show back in, gosh, what was that, January of 21, which is kind of crazy to say. So that was uh, two years ago now. So we've got a lot of ground really to cover and find out where you guys have gone here in the last two years. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Sam. Appreciate you having me back. Absolutely, man. Ryan, there are three questions I ask every guest who comes to the show. You may have answered this in the last episode, but we'll do it once again. Where did you start? Where are you now? And how did you get there? Yeah, I started uh, as an airline pilot and transitioned to a full-time real estate investor, full-time uh, business owner. And uh, where I am today, we have about a half a billion in assets under management from primarily self-storage. Uh, we have just a little over 100 employees spread across, I think, 12 states now, following in the footsteps of others, having great mentors, and uh, and then surrounding myself with great business partners. I think it's been really crucial to that. So, great. yeah. Love it, yeah. man. I love it. Do you uh, do you still actively fly? For fun. Okay. <laughs> Just for fun. <laughs> no, no, no longer a professional airline pilot. No longer. Okay. So. All right. So you, you, you hung up, hung up your professional wings. I mean, and that's, that's kind of hard to do. I mean, right now, I mean, airline pilots are in high demand, but obviously you got super high on other, other things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There, it's a, a great time to get into the profession. Actually, if you're thinking about that, it's a, a fantastic time. Um, there's a lot of demand and there's a lot of uh, demand for air travel yep. uh, and a lot of retiring uh, commercial airline pilots due to you know, baby boomer generation kind of cycling out and uh, actually just kind of a lack of uh, people getting into the space. So um, it's an interesting time for sure. It is for sure. I know that was probably hard for you. I'm a recreational pilot and it's hard. Uh, I can only imagine giving up that because I'm sure it was a lot of fun to fly and probably hard to give up, give up the uh, left seat on a, on a commercial jet for uh, just for recreational fun now. But uh, nevertheless, I digress. I want to talk really about what you guys are working on in Spartan today. I mean, I know if you want to hear Ryan's backstory again, you can go back to that episode in January of 21. That's episode again, number 41. You can hear more of his backstory there. But we're not going to get an update on what 2023 looks like for you guys. Maybe hear your strategic plan. Maybe hear just kind of some of the things you guys are working on. Yeah. So in 2019, we set a three-year plan and that ended uh, three days ago. So uh, that that plan basically encompassed uh, three goals: uh, one, to buy two hundred and fifty million dollars of real estate. We checked that box. Uh, really lay the the foundation for good systems and a and a company to uh, to really go out and explore up to three different asset classes. Now we didn't do three different asset classes. We decided to stay very focused in self storage. So that's what we've done um, in the last three year cycle. So and that's what we're looking at going forward uh, in the future. And then, um, but we just got out of our strategic planning for the next three-year strategic plan, which, uh, you know, is a big mountain that we've set out there, but we want to be a company with 5 billion in assets under management by the end of 2025 and 1 billion in revenue. And, uh, and then all the accommodating kind of strategic goals and objectives that, that follow or kind of flow up to those things. Um, and you know, really what we want to be excellent in kind of what we do, right? Everything that we do, we want to be excellent. And so we've got a, a focus on getting a net promoter score, uh, internally and externally from our, from our customers to our investors, to our employees that talk to each other or work, work with uh, cross departmental, uh, of at least a 52. So that's kind of one of the things that we, that we've laid out. Um, and part of that comes with um, a lot of capital to raise and also uh, a stretch into buying potentially another operating company 
are doing a private equity play. So really excited about uh, the next three years. Man, that's that. That's a lot of moving pieces. I have no idea what a net promoter score. So if if you can't break, if you can just break that down for maybe me and our listeners, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, it you know you could throw it into Google, but at the end of the day, it's you know how likely are you to recommend me hmm. to others? That is, uh, you know, the experience that you have, uh, in what in the product that you're or your service that you're that you're uh, undertaking. How how likely are is that person to talk about you or talk about your experience to other people kind of unprompted. That's what, that's my definition of it. But at the end of the day, you're asked and quizzed on certain things that add up to a total score and companies that do really well have uh, usually a a promoter score of about 30. Mm -hmm. And uh, so 52 is like really, really good. That's up there with, you know, the likes of, you know, Apple or Delta airlines Alaska Airlines, et cetera, getting into the aviation side of things. Um, you know, very good net promoter scores, very successful companies have uh, a 50 or a higher. So, got it. Okay, cool. Well, there's some homework for those of you listening. Uh, <laughs> go out and figure out what a net promoter score is and then also how to implement and actually get that <laughs> measured. I'm sure there's a second component to that. Let's talk a little bit about strategic planning. I know you guys just laid out your strategic plan. What's it look like for you guys to actually sit down and have those meetings and get that dialed in and decide on what that strategic plan is? Yeah, it it starts with the whole company actually, kind of a catch ball methodology where we're we're giving assignments to the team, they're giving us their inputs, and then we kind of boil all that up into um, a strategic planning session or a strategic plan uh, for the next three years, but. We start with what's called a environmental scan, which is uh, there's an acronym, and I don't, I'm not going to nail every single uh, one of them, um, called PESTEL, where you look at your political, social, environmental, uh, tax, legal, uh, investing, external environments, and we talk about what is going on in the entire world, right? And anything, anything is out there. We we talk about politics. We talk about um, tax changes we talk about investment changes social uh social you know social issues that are that are plaguing the world or that have potential to do that and we get all those things kind of in in the pot for discussion um, the other things that we do is we'll talk about we'll do a SWOT analysis and we'll do a SWOT analysis by department you know so we'll go through and say you know investor relations what are our strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats construction team property ops team uh, executive leadership team or, or for Spartan, you know, what, what is our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And we'll kind of affinitize a lot of the things that sort of boil up to the surface as our kind of our key things that we want to focus on. And that is really kind of what helps us kind of, kind of boil down to what are the, what are the things that we can take advantage of and, and opportunities and what are our weaknesses that we can, you know, our strengths and weaknesses that we can control and how can we translate that into, an actionable plan um, that meets the mission of where we want to go. But some of this comes from, you know, kind of having, uh, you know, your BHAG or your big, hairy, audacious goal. And you say, hey, let's throw out, you know, a five to 10 year goal that's so uh, ridiculous in our minds to achieve, you know, so big thinking and then kind of work into that and see if we can't make sense into how to get there, how to roadmap it. Um, So we had a big, hairy, audacious goal in 10 years to have, um, create wealth for every Spartan and serve a hundred thousand active investors. And so um, that's kind of our, our guiding, you know, five to 10 year, big, hairy, audacious goal or BHAG, but our strategic plan kind of just boils on down into what, what are these next three years look like? Um, And then of course, every year we do a roadmap for what we want to accomplish in the year as a company. And we put that all up over the walls and then we boil that down into what each department uh, it, one year roadmap looks like. Um, so that that's kind of it, very, very <laughs> a brief, abbreviated version of the strategic planning. But um, a lot of collaboration, a lot of finitization, a lot of throwing out ideas that um, just can't, you know, that we that thinking bigger, challenging ourselves, um, you know, as a company and then kind of boiling that down into, okay, what do we need to do this quarter or this year uh, to accomplish a three-year journey? 
What do you feel like was one thing you've done well to transition yourself out of being in the business of buying storage facilities to actually being a business owner? I mean, because what you're talking about here really it has nothing to do with so far actually owning and operating storage facilities. It is all about running a business. Does that question make sense? It does make sense. And it's really, it's a really good one and important. Um, I think that it's important to have a mission, vision values. And I know that that is um, sort of a squishy thing that nobody really wants to focus on. You know, you get into, you get into real estate and you're like, um, you know, where do I, where do I, let's, you know, let's talk about mission, vision, values. And you spend like two seconds on it and you say, okay, how do, how do, how do we, how do we start making money? Right. Or how do we start doing deals? <clears throat> and I think the more you can focus on that, I think it gets you a better long-term, where are we headed? Where are we going? Um, there was a really great uh, Simon Sinek video uh, on floating around on LinkedIn the other day that talked about, you know, getting to your destination and, and defining what your de destination is. And if you know where you're going, if you know what the destination is, all the little obstacles and challenges that come along the way are not as uh, challenging because you know that, hey, I'm going to get to this really great destination. I'm driving the car to the Pacific Northwest and we're going to have a great vacation. And, and, and we know that well, we might be crossing the Rockies or whatever, and and uh, there's a snowstorm, but and we have to deviate for a day. But oh well, we're going on vacation. We're going to the Pacific Northwest for for you know for a month or for a week or whatever, right? And so I think by having a mission, vision, values, and you have your your BHAG, and everybody kind of knows the destination of where your company is going, then it becomes a matter of just plugging in the things like the annual roadmap. What do we have to do this quarter? What do we have to do this year? What do we have to do <clears throat> as individuals to to roll this up and to, and to get to where we're going? Um, but everybody can kind of keep that big picture in mind. And that way, when you have a disappointing year like 2022 was for probably a lot of people, you can say, hey, you know, it didn't go as well as we thought, but we're getting to our destination, right? We may, we may have had a goal to drive, you know, 300 miles a day, and we only got 100 miles in 2022, but we all know what 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 the prize is at the end of the road. And I think if you start thinking that way, I think you can start rolling, uh, you can start rolling up the organization in a way that um, keeps you out of the maybe the the nuances of the day to day and more into the strategy of kind of where you want to go as a as a business. Yeah, and it probably also, um, you know, I think one of the things that, that you're saying there it keeps it keeps you from the highs and the lows. I mean, because there's so yeah. much of this that's like, oh, yeah, sweet, man. We just closed a $20 million deal. And then you're like, oh, man, we just lost three $20 million deals. It just kind of all those things, you know, you, you, you tend to kind of lose <laughs> some of that. It normalizes it. Maybe that's the way I'm trying to say it is when you when you kind of have that, this is this is the flag. This is where we're going. You know, you kind of you don't have to deal with as much of that uh, high and low on that front. Let's talk about your funds. I know one of the things you guys are launching this year, it's kind of a different way of bringing in capital in ways that you guys are going to uniquely serve your investor base. Tell me about the funds you guys are launching, and then maybe I'll have some questions really inside of those as well. Yeah, so I think it's important to talk about you know like the investors' um, mindset and where they want to go, right? So we're we're trying to anticipate the destinations of our investors. You know, some investors are, um, you know, they just want to convert hard hard earned income into passive investing in, in cash flow, right? And some investors who are trying to swing for the fences and, and knock it out of the park with some crazy multiple. And some investors who just want that kind of, they want to put their toe in the water, or maybe they want something a little bit more uh, consistent with maybe not as much upside. So this year, what we did was we decided to uh, kind of put out three different funds where if you really want that cash flow and the upside, uh, we have an income fund that focuses on self storages that are cash flowing. If you want to, you know, really get uh, down and dirty, you don't care about the cash flow. You want to just focus on that development upside. We have a growth fund that is just going to target self storages that are in lease up or they're they're we're building them from the ground up. And then you have uh, our third fund, which is a debt fund. Uh, which will service uh, properties and provide flexible debt for the two funds that I talked about earlier, uh, where we can provide investors with consistent, regular cash flow that's backed by real estate, backed by self-storage. 
And um, I think by by giving those three, it, it kind of helps the investors sort of decide on their own or with their financial advisor, um, you know, what one makes the most sense based on where I am in my investment investing journey. We're just providing those those different options, those different vehicles. So. How much of this is uh, were these spurred by conversations you guys had with investors versus how how much of it is just you anticipating what investors might want? You know, it's both. And, you know, again, great question. I, I think uh, over the years, you know, we've done development. We Our very first syndications were all ground up developments. And, uh, you know, we started with no cash flow deals and our investors got very accustomed to sort of high return, you know, development deals. And, uh, you know, it's kind of funny because a lot of people don't start that way. It's harder to, you know, some people think it's harder to raise for development deals. I think our list is more curated actually for development deals <laughs> than cash flow deals. Uh, but then we started buying cash flow properties and investors started to really enjoy that. And, um, you know, I think uh, just being able to, to be flexible, um, you know, to, to be, you know, last year in, in last year, we just offered a in, basically an income fund. Our Spartan storage fund one was just based on cash flowing properties. We're going to get you to this cash on cash. And, and so everybody going in kind of knew the drill, what they were going to get. Um, but I think that there's, uh, there's, there's opportunities that we kind of passed on or overlooked because they had a high, very high multiple or very high IRR or, or cash on cash or annual return. But they didn't fit for the fund because we didn't want to we didn't want to mismanage expectations of cash flow versus that. So we wanted to we wanted to be able to offer the different variations uh, based on people's uh, goals of cash flow um, or, or goals of ultimate upside. We've had a lot of investors like, yeah, I'm in your fund. You know, I don't really care about your five, six percent distribution that you might push out every month. What I care about is, you know, I just I'm, I, I'm a believer in self storage. I know in the long run this is going to do really well. Uh, and I'm just going for that absolute multiple. So listening to our investors and then kind of reflecting on our past has been uh, kind of the drivers to it. How much of the debt fund is fueled by um, the debt markets today? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> that's another good question, man. It's like you do this for uh, for a <laughs> living. Um, yeah, I, I would say it has less to do with today than it does to do with benefiting um our current opportunities. Mm. So for example, you know, we took down a uh, pretty big loan on a on a portfolio, 56 million dollar loan to to take on a value add deal. And you get this is in good times. This is rewind a year where we're looking at uh you know really low interest rates, you know, 3% range, right, 3 to 4% range and um we would go to market and we'd say, hey, we have this, you know, we have this portfolio of properties. We have this loan that we want to get on it. And by the way, we want to expand this portfolio by, you know, say 160,000 square feet. So would you provide us the acquisition financing plus the construction financing? Mm -hmm. And some banks would be like, eh, we'll give you the money to buy it, but we won't give you the money to expand it. And those terms were really attractive. But some banks would say, hey, we'll give you the money to buy it and expand it, but the terms weren't as attractive. Mm. And so even when you couple the high interest rate debt that the debt fund is going to provide our investors and uh, put that on the portfolio, just for the construction portion, the weighted cost of capital is still significantly lower than going with the loan lender that would take the whole thing down. So that was that was kind of one thing. The other thing is speed, speed and acquisition, you know, having a, a flexible debt fund and then just giving the investors an opportunity to invest, uh, you know, often in a certain in a first position or in something that's, you know, a very well stabilized property um, is also a great way to, you know, for new investors is to see that it works. You know, some people are kind of skeptical of real estate syndications, totally, totally uh, understand why. But hey, try us out in our debt fund. You know, it, it might be a, a good entree to that. But what? also today, Go yeah, ahead. today's market, I, I was going to say today's market, of course, um, you know, our ability to get loans hasn't um, been hindered, but obviously the rate and terms um, are pretty, are pretty limiting. And we're not, we're not taking on any floating rate debt uh, loans right now. So we want everything fixed rate. Uh, so I think we, we, you know, I think fundamentally self-storage and real estate is very, is very strong and it'll, it'll stay that way. 
Um, but I think, you know, getting good debt into place, you know, you need more flexibility with that. And I think the debt fund will really provide that. That's really cool. You gave great, great insight and answers on that. Certainly appreciate it. One kind of practical question on that front. If you say you take it and I'm just making up a number here, I don't know what the size of the debt fund is, but let's say it's 10 million bucks. What if there is a gap just between the time that you take the money in and the time that it's actually deployed? Say you sit on eight of that 10 million for 30 days. Like how do you guys manage servicing the debt on an idle asset? Or is that yes. a problem? Well, I, I mean, it may, it just would be probably returned uh, to our investors. So, uh, you know, that would be something that we would have to, we'd have to give the cap, cash back or we would stop uh, providing, uh, you know, per, stop, uh, you know, bringing in solicitations or right. investments in, in that case. You know, I would say capital raising is like landing a helicopter on a, on a snow capped mountain, right? You get, you get up there and, you know, you, you have that target, right. Of exactly how much you're going to raise. And, you know, the snow starts blowing up and you can't really see the landing spot anymore. And, and you're kind of going back and forth and trying to put that thing right on the top of the mountain. And it's hard. Yeah. And so, you know, cash drag's never going to be perfect. It's, it's never going to be exactly where you want it, but, you know, you kind of can, collaborate as a team and make sure that you're bringing in, you know, just enough cash to not have too much cash drag, but also the cash that you need to, uh, to do your deal. So. Got it. Absolutely. Yeah. Love it. Ryan, thanks for taking the time to come back on the show today. I certainly appreciate it. As always, the pleasure is, uh, absolutely mine. If our listeners want to get in touch with you or learn more about you, what is the best way to do that? Yeah. My, uh, email is Ryan at Spartan hyphen investors.com, or you can catch me on LinkedIn as Ryan Gibson. Awesome. Thanks again, Ryan. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big.